the, um, the, the manager role here. Y'all are going to want to go to the primary school section, which is, starts on page 11. And I was noticing as I was flipping, you know, Allison said, well, look at my, my pie chart, it's all blue. But if you look at all of the school buildings, their pie charts are pretty blue too. They're very Mine's probably more blue than hers. <laughs> very people centric, and it's only if you look at a place that's more district wide, like if you look at curriculum and assessment on page 57, because Monique is providing resources and supplies and, and software to the, to the whole district. Hers looks a little bit different. Todd's looks a little bit different, but most of the schools are super people heavy. Um, and now you know where to go and, and to tell you all about it. Which the, the only thing I would add to that is when when we talk about the fact that 96.6% of K2's budget is personnel, um, that gives you a sense of how much discretionary spending is actually um, available to our school leaders and to our teachers. And so this really requires us to reach out to families and anyone who's a parent in the community, you know how many times or how often you are asked to um, supplement your child's education, whether it's through user fees or supplies or field trips or parking passes or the laptop um, payment. So uh, I think that's one important thing for our community to understand is that the it's the, the burden is not even across, the burden of providing a thorough and efficient education to our students is not even across our community. Parents are actually supplementing the budget um, annually at, at, at a significant cost. I mean, I have yet to uh, be able to nail down all the things we ask parents to do in terms of contributing to our um, our operate, our day-to-day -day operations, but it, it's significant. So that's another important factor for us to keep in mind as we're now going into the schools. And so we're going to go right in phase level order, starting with K2. Um, Anne, ha Anne and um, Kelly are, might combine for their 20 minutes, but they both have 20 minutes if they need it. And then we have questions also. All right. Go ahead, Anne. All right. Thank you. So um, K2, we, we continue to have the challenge of three buildings and great distances across the town. So um, our challenge of professional development and having time for all kindergarten teachers or all first grade teachers to be together is um, a, one of our greatest challenges. Um, and so we continue to try to find as many opportunities as we can to meet together, to make the most of our, of our staff development and professional development opportunities. Um, I feel like sometimes I should have a satellite office here at Wentworth because we meet here so much because it's such a fabulous place. We all fit. Everybody travels sort of equal distances, so it, it makes sense. Um, and they're always so gracious to have us. But um, and it does provide for cross grade level groupings as well when we second to third, which is always a, a nice thing to be able to do as well. Um, but our our greatest challenge is time, and uh, we just do not have enough professional opportunities all together. Um, to do that, and so that's the time crunch portion of, of the slide there. Um, um, so we are, as you know, we have been um, working with the unit to study for reading and writing now, and the reading um, implementation is full on, and teachers are loving it. They're seeing the connection between their units of study for reading and writing very clearly and deeply. Um, it doesn't feel as new as the writing did a year, two years ago, because it can buy, it connects so so well together. Um, I think teachers are constantly amazed at how far their kids are progressing. And as Monique said, you know, a few years ago, the end of kindergarten expectation was to be exposed to 21 sight words, and now it's that's expected them to know them, not just be exposed, not just to have seen them, not just to have heard about them, but to know them by January. Um, we're constantly rethinking about what is our academic support threshold, because it's six months behind where we expect kids to be, and now our six months behind is above where our kids ever were expected to be three years ago. So. Is that behind? Because that was where that was above grade level a few years ago. So it's this recalibration in our head all the time of, wait, are they struggling or are they really doing pretty well? Wait, what is it? Um, and we're just so amazed at how far they're going. 
in their reading and writing, especially with this new curriculum. And um, you know, we infused a huge number of new books into each classroom library this past summer, and I think we're expecting to infuse. I see Monique nodding. Yes, that's what I was hoping she was doing. To infuse more this year, and kids just are loving it. The nonfiction books, animals. You know, re reading about real things and not just storybooks. Um, not that fiction doesn't have a huge and important place, but um, but we need a variety of books, and we just didn't have them, and now we do. Um, so it's really awesome to see kids reading, to hear kids talking about strategies about reading um, and writing and math, and to connect to the video that Julie showed earlier about it's not it's not what you know, it's knowing how to find it out. And that's what we're teaching these kids with these curriculums is the strategies to figure things out. So it's the strategies to figure out new words, the strategies to figure out how, how to figure out what that means or what that picture is. Or, and it's not just learning to read, but think, learning to problem solve, learning how to figure things out that you don't, don't know, whether it's a new word or a new concept or a new animal or... Um, it's just so exciting to hear all the academic talking that's going on in classes these days. Um, it, to also connect with uh, what Allison was saying, we do see um, every year um, a number of kiddos that come in without any sort of identification, without any sort of assistance, with <coughs> some significant needs. Um, and all, all three buildings have this issue, so our behavior specialist is um, spread very thin across the three schools, even though she's now all K-2. Um, and I don't know what we would do without her, because she spends a, a, a nice chunk of time with these kiddos and tries to figure out what's going on with them, what are their motivations, what are their interests, what are what's driving force behind their behavior, whether it's positive behavior or unexpected behavior, um, and then tries to put a plan in place that we can follow in in time until they either are identified or not, but um, to have success in school and to be and to keep the disruption and safety disruption at a minimum and safety at a maximum. Um, so that is a, a huge part of the time we spend at K2 um, from uh, leadership pers perspective, um, and that takes away resources that we would be using otherwise. Um, I mean, as an example, in my building, I have two kiddos that my building ed techs are with 100% of the time right now, um, who are not identified, who are just regular five-year-old kiddos, um, which means my office has nobody in it to cover IEPs, to cover unfilled subpositions, to cover other things, um, unless I bring in more subs, and then <laughs> we're like at this tipping point, like, when do we get more subs than we have real employees? <laughs> not quite there, but um, it's, it's significant um, this year, especially. Um, so that is a challenge for us as, as kindergartners and kindergarten in first and second grade. I'm not saying that doesn't happen either, but it's primarily the kindergartners. Um, so, um, oh, I gotta do this slide too. So we're very fortunate that our population isn't growing significantly. Um, we are actually in a very um, stable sort of place. But um, we are not asking for any major new investments in any people other than the principal. And I'll let, I think I'm going to let districts talk about that, sure. right? Central office is talking about that position um, more than, than I will. But um, we always can use, um, you know, more time for professional development, more time for um, our one-to-one -one technology. We have these fabulous... Chromebooks for every student, and we use them as much as we can. But again, it's a matter of teachers need to know how to use them better in order to use them more and to use them more effect effectively. And we haven't had as much time as we would like to be able to, to get into that. So we're always looking for those opportunities as well. Um, we're continuing on our path of student centered learning and, and goal setting, and um, students learning those metacognitive skills of. What am I learning? Why am I learning it? And how am I going to know when I get there? What do I need to do to get there? Those steps. Um, and so we're starting in kindergarten with um, setting goals and, and with their parents or um, with their teachers and then tracking that progress. And hopefully that will build. And as kids get older and as they get up, uh, up into the upper grades, 
the teachers at Wentworth will feel the benefit of that, and then as they go on, they'll all see it happening, and oh my gosh, they couldn't do this a few years ago, but you can really see the progression. Um, so I think that's um, pretty much our whole um, idea right now, and you know, our next year we're, um, we're looking forward to a new leadership structure, um, and, uh, and continuing all the things that our teachers are doing in their PLTs, um, especially with student-centered learning, and also mindfulness. Um, and again, five, six, and seven-year-olds learning that they are in control of their bodies, their minds, their learning, and it all is a, you know, the whole child, not just reading and writing and math. Um, I promised I would be short, so if you have questions. Yes, Chris? Okay. So, Dan, could you um, give us an idea of, of K2 or KK registration at this point? Are you seeing a, a slight tick up or are you seeing less average, normal? What are you, what are you seeing for new enrollees? So, I know we get things through the course of the year, but are we seeing a general trend up? Or? Uh, not a trend up at this point, I'm pretty flat right now. Um, so, I think the first grade class, our current first grade class, is on the smaller side. So, when you look at K2 and in general, right now, the, the first grade class overall is just a little bit smaller, and I can't explain that, but um, other than it just is what it is. But um, our income, the ones we registered last week, is about the same number as we have now, and you know, we're always expect about a 10 to 15 percent increase between now and, and August, so um, given that, that variable, we're, we're looking at about similar class size to what we have now. <coughs> Right about 200. So, do you tend to see? I mean, we've got a lot of new housing stock coming into Scarborough. Do you? Would you anticipate seeing kind of mid-year starts as well, or do you think most people will kind of either you know move in and wait till they get? Do you tend to see a spike at the beginning of the year, or do you have you seen in the past like if a new project comes online? You, you we might certainly see a little spike at the beginning of the year. You know, the August, late August registration, but uh, there hasn't been a month in this year that I haven't had new students coming in. I think I um, I had one start today. I had one start. You know, people are like, you have kids starting after February vacation? And it's like, well, yeah, I don't think jobs dictate, you know, waiting till June to move or. <laughs> so yeah, we had kids starting at Christmas. We have, we, we have kids starting all the time. Um, so I think we've had a net, only a net gain of maybe eight this year, but um, we have had and that's happened at all three schools. We just looked at that enrollment. And, you know, looking at enrollment, um, I think, you know, when you see the benefits of, of a building like Wentworth, you can see what would we get it if we had a consolidated K-2, you know, the pros and cons of that. We could save at least four um, classroom teaching positions if we were all in one building. And our class sizes would be much more evenly distributed. And, you know, we wouldn't have... 20 kids in the first grade classes at Pleasant Hill, but 15 at Blue Point just because they're across town. We could consolidate them and have much more even distribution and, you know, have fewer classrooms overall without overcrowding anybody. Um, so as much as I love my little school and we all love our neighborhood schools, I, I think that we can create intimacy in, in K-2 education and more efficiency at the same time. I don't think they mutually exclude each other. Well, I think it also would provide more professional development opportunities for the teachers to collaborate and work mm -hmm. together. Absolutely. And so we actually are, every month we look at our enrollment and we're also looking at projections for next year. That was a big part of the initial pre-budget work that we did. So just today, Joanne um, and Anne and I were looking at, you know, what do, what do our K-2 projections look like? So this year, currently, we have 201 current, uh, kindergartners, 177 first graders, and 225 second graders. And then next year, we're projecting... Um, currently, we have 174 kids enrolled in K, but remember what Ann said, that 10 to 15 percent, um, you know, bump that we get at the time of registrations. We have, we'll have 201 first graders and 177 second graders. And so, um, one thing that we do know is that we will have one, last, one less uh, kindergarten section at Blue Point School. 
um, but that we also know that we need one additional first grade section just because of the size of the classes. So we are always looking at those numbers, um, and we'll continue to look at them over the summer as families move in and out. But when I do a, a historical analysis of our enrollment, um, right about this time of year, our enrollment tends to go up about 20 to 30 students. Um, so we start a little bit lower than we end, and that seems to be a trend over the past few years. And um, another question for Ann about about the primary school? Well, actually, it's more directed towards you. Sure. You mentioned that at Blue Point you were seeing a shift where you were going to lose one K classroom and add a first grade classroom. So historically, have you, well, and since this is your first year, maybe yeah, I'll look at your hand here. Um, historically, have you had that occur more often at Blue Point, or is it very, does it vary from school to the K2 to exactly. school to school? I mean, you can answer this, but I think just knowing the K-2 phase as well as I do, um, I can tell you that about um, six years ago, Blue Point was our largest school at 300, and it's just taken a nosedive in, in enrollment. There were 15 homerooms and, you know, over 300 kids, and now we're at um, 11 homerooms and just about 200 kids there. So, you know, the, the boom out Broad Turn Road sort of, calmed down after they put the moratorium on housing starts or put the limit on it, and now we're seeing that lifted and things going back up a little bit. Um, and obviously with the, the housing starts with multiple family homes and apartments and different kinds of not just, you know, mid-range, not starter homes, but, you know, larger homes on larger pieces of property out that were being built, at, you know, a few years ago. And, and this is completely anecdotal, but at the kindergarten information night, we had an amazing turnout. I mean, the Wentworth CAF was full of families, and then they broke up into, um, <clears throat> you know, neighborhoods. And so I was just listening in and supporting Lisa Roberts, who's our lead teacher at Pleasant Hill, and talking to Pleasant Hill families. And of the families that were there, it seemed like many of them, this was their first student coming into Pleasant Hill, um, and they had a, a younger sibling or two at home. So I think that that'll be, we'll see some fluctuation in that neighborhood as well. All those families that have the grown kids now that are out of college, have right. and so the young families have their homes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, we... It's definitely, I think Pleasant Hill has had the most stable population <laughs> over time. Um, and it just depends on, and we've we shifted lines as well to accommodate. So, you know, just because Blue Point's numbers are lower, it's because I did take a neighborhood uh, away from them a few years ago so that those kids were still there, it wouldn't be ne nearly as, as big of a drop. But Multiple times. <laughs> Um, and then I would just add a little bit of information about the K-2 principal at this point um, while we're talking about the primary schools. So um, you, sh you may know that currently we have two principals and an assistant principal that support our three K-2 schools. That was um, an alternative, like Plan B, I think is the language I hear, um, a, a, an alternative plan that was meant to be temporary a few years ago when we were transitioning into the new Wentworth. If, if I'm saying this accurately, feel free to help me. Um, and so the feedback that I've been getting both during my entry process and the one-on-one -on -one interviews that I had, but then also visiting the schools um, and talking with the leadership is that this has been a, an extreme challenge for us to provide the quality of programming that we know um, all of our primary schools need and deserve. And one of the things I like to say is that you can't really schedule student needs. You can't, you know, plan for a principal to be there Tuesday afternoon and the kids wait for you to get there before they need you. When they need you, they need you. And so um, having been a principal of a small primary school, I know how busy it can be and how important it is to have leadership in the building for the students, the staff, and the parents. And so in this budget, through um, some realignment of funds, we are proposing that we bring back that principal position, um, but we're enhancing the job duties a bit. So um, Pleasant Hill is our smallest primary school with uh, currently 174 students, um, maybe 175 today. And so uh, what when Ann Cass retires, who's the assistant principal at the end of this year, we want to replace um, not replace her, but to fill the position with a, a full-time principal whose primary job will be to be the principal of Pleasant Hill School, but who will also serve in that improvement strategist role across the phase level. So again, realizing the benefits of having that strong instructional leadership 
to support the leader um, the leadership at the high school this year with um, Catherine Ruby's um, joining us, Catherine Ruby joining our team. Uh, one of the budgetary requests was that we need one of those, we need a position like that at K-5 to really do this work. We need a position like that at the middle school. And so um, we are solving the, the principal situation or maximizing this opportunity of the retirement to bring back that full-time principal, but also requiring um, this person to be a really strategic planner who can help develop a data um, or an evidence-based culture that is, is really focused on student learning and can help us continually grow. So that'll be one of the primary functions of that principal as well, along with working really closely with Ann and Kelly, our, um, our current principals, to, um, to support all of the teachers in their professional development um, and maximizing that protected professional development time that we have so we get the best return on our investment. And so you'll hear about the middle school, the similar position in the middle school that also comes through realignment, no additional um, resources requested, and then at the high school um, where we are requesting some additional resources. So my optimistic hope is that you're all like, what about Wentworth? Don't we need that position here at Wentworth? And um, I'll take it. not to steal <laughs> any of Kelly's thunder, but the answer is yes, desperately. This is a huge building um, with a lot of kids and they're doing amazing work, but we believe that this position is just as essential here. Um, but uh, as Kelly starts to talk about the needs of her face level, you'll see that the enrollment is projected to be consistent almost exactly um, to the number of students that we currently have. So our, our plan is to plant the seed and have you know how important this position is, but be able to come back with you next year with some um, rock solid evidence that shows the benefit of this position because we are anticipating a little decline in enrollment next year at, um, at Wentworth and we have some anticipated retirements that we feel we might be able to again realign and make that a reality for Wentworth. Um, unless you'd like to uh, accelerate that plan, we're also open to that as well. Okay. Any questions about that? I just have one clarification. And maybe I misunderstood. So you said that Anne is staying at eight corners. And Kelly Mullen Martin, Martin is staying at. So she's Pleasant currently Hill. the. No, Blue she'll Point. be at Blue Point. Okay, that was what I thought you said. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if I actually said that. But um, the position that we, and we have posted it as an anticipated opening, knowing that we can't hire until the budget is approved, but we wanted to make sure we were recruiting the best staff we could. Um, we posted it as an anticipated opening for Pleasant Hill School and K2 Improvement Strategist, okay. so that we are really clear about the type of um, skills we are looking for in our next year. So then Kelly Mullen Mark is going to be full-time. Okay. Yeah, she'll be the full-time principal at Blue Point. Um, and, uh, well, and just to add to that a little bit too, it's been really challenging for, for her and Anne to navigate and to really support those two buildings because um, you know buildings have their own culture and their own climate and it really requires that level of um, personal leadership to be successful. Thank you. Well, and, and Julie alluded to it, but <coughs> the temporary situation of that leadership model was um, a few years ago when we were really thinking we were going to be consolidating at least one of the, or two of the K2s into one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was sort of, oh well, we'll sort of move our way toward that in the leadership team. And now it seems like we're um, quite a bit further away from that type of move. And in the meantime, we really need to give those buildings the leadership that they need Any other questions about primary school? Well, <laughs> uh, we continue to be absolutely thrilled with our, our fabulous facility and all of the learning opportunities that um, the school opens up for our students and our staff has worked incredibly hard um, now in our third year to make the transition and really capitalize on all of those um, investments that the community has made in our building. So, um, as Julie mentioned, there is no projected change for enrollment for 1718 for Wentworth School. Um, so, I didn't have any of those um, flexible options that other phases have for next year. However, we're constantly examining our existing resources and will continue to do so with an eye toward two things. Um, one being that, as Anne mentioned, 
the second grade class, the incoming second grade class will have um, about a class fewer students. So there's some potential um, reallocation for 18-19 at Wentworth School. And additionally, um, our demographic is, um, is a bit unique in that over the next several years, um, there are projected to be at least a handful of retirements over the next several years here at Wentworth School. So that just creates um, opportunity and options. So um, for, for this year, however, um, the student-centered budget um, I am deferring to 1819. So the two positions that you'll hear a lot more about, and you just heard a bit about the. Um, I think I used the language of last week. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, uh, it's been updated recently. <laughs> Improvement strategist. Improvement strategist is um, the the title that we're all championing <laughs> at this at this time. So um, I do think that that is a really big need for Wentworth School um, because. In our current structure, it's three school leaders um, funneling students to two school leaders in a giant um, in a giant school with a lot of um, complex and diverse needs. So um, we're doing just fine, and we're hanging in there. And but I just think of all the potential that um, that this school and this staff has. So to to um, continue to improve. Um, and the other investment, the other future investment is um, you'll hear a bit more about this from. Barb, um, she has included a bridge teacher position at um, the middle school this year and has seen such tremendous gains and um, a huge return on investment for this position. And we face similar challenges here at Wentworth School. The position in a nutshell, and I don't want to steal Barb's thunder, is to support um, regular ed students um, when they return to school from a significant illness, injury, absences, if they're new to district, and um, we have an extremely rigorous curriculum and they're just behind due to lack of instruction in that area. So it's sort of like a quick intensive care and coaching model and uh, with the goal of returning students to their classroom um, feeling really confident and up to speed. So those are future investments to think about. Um, the mission critical for this year, which would require um, no budget impact uh, for one more school, um, obviously, we continue to really require professional learning and staff training. That's something that has been an investment with our new curriculum. We have um, consultants that have <coughs> regularly to work with our teachers from uh, with our teachers' college um, reading and writing curriculum. I, I could echo, echo all of the things that Anne has said um, about the improvements that we're seeing in our students and how um, far they have come. And I'm. Um, I sometimes say a recovering middle school teacher, but um, a former middle school teacher. And what I see the students at Wentworth doing um, are the skills and things that were definitely happening in middle school five years ago. Um, so it's really exciting, and the energy that the students bring and the, um, the delight and curiosity that they share every day um, with this work has been energizing for all of us. So continues to be a focus. Um, the other small um, piece is something that I'm really proud of, the work that we've done here this year, is that we've made a transition that doesn't sound maybe necessarily groundbreaking, but um, our goal was every student, every day, out to recess. It is not, um, it's not a incentive for good behavior, it's not um, an option, it's as essential a part of, of eight, nine, or ten year olds day as reading instruction. So we've really taken a huge step in that direction. Um, I think what was happening just for, for the public is some just well-intentioned um, historical practices, like, oh, you've been absent a couple days, just stay in for recess and I'll get you caught up, or in response to unexpected behavior, stay in, let's talk about this, or um, even clubs, some clubs have taken place historically over in lieu of recess. So a couple of things that we've done, um, we redesigned our schedule this year and it's been fabulous and we're really excited about those changes. One of the things that we included um, was rise time, so remediate, improve, stretch, and enrich, and that time is designated for all of those things that felt could only previously take place in lieu of recess. So the only, the only thing 
the only group that stayed in for recess this year um, for six days, over six recesses, over six weeks, was chorus. You can't, you can't meet at lunch and practice a song. So that, um, we, we made an administrative waiver for that this year, um, but that leads me to the investment that we need, and it's really not an investment. It would be offset by anticipated retirement savings. I'd like to move um, two clubs that currently take place within the school day at Wentworth, Chorus being one of them because, as like I said, you can't, well, sing and have pizza at the same time, um, and also our K-Kids. K-Kids has historically met over lunch and recess. It's been compacted to just a lunch meeting. It's a, not enough time for them to do the really great work that they do. It's a service club. Um, and B, it is, um, enrollment is hindered by time, space, and available staffing. So if we move this to an after-school club, and this stipend would allow for growth and have it be a more open enrollment opportunity for students. So um, those are the two small things that we're thinking about for next year. So what will we continue to do? We are going to continue to focus on all of the wonderful previous investments um, that have been made at this base level. Um, I spoke already to the literacy learning and professional development. Um, all of the thing, those three things, units of study for reading and for writing, the huge investment in building classroom libraries and the shift in instruction that has taken place as a result of that, um, that students can shop right in their classroom for a book that is at their reading level and have so many options of genres and titles has been um, really accelerated our reading and writing exponentially. Um, and then Words Their Way is our spelling and vocabulary curriculum. And all of this, all of this has happened within the last two years while transitioning into a new state-of-the-art building um, while learning how to work the lights, the copiers, and be a one-to-one -one school, um, our teachers are exhausted but amazing, and they they've done a really incredible job. So the professional development and support that is um, still required for them, I don't ever want to lose um, emphasis on that. Um, the other recent investment in this state-of-the-art facility is that we want to leverage the resources of our four STEM labs that were so cleverly included in the building design. And in, uh, two years ago, we added one STEM teacher position, and this year we have the second STEM teacher position, which means that all students all year receive STEM instruction um, weekly, and our, our teachers are doing an incredible job with integrating, working with our instructional coach, working with classroom teachers, working um, the things that are happening in STEM classes will boggle your mind. Every time I go in to spend time in there, Joanne was in there just the other day, I'm learning about all of these discrete sets of code and the language of computing, and the eight-year-olds are just <laughs> you know, able to do it no problem. And they're talking about nested loops and how to, it, it's, really, it's really phenomenal. Most recently, I just have to brag on this project a little bit. Um, the STEM teachers collaborated with some of our garden champions, and they are um, they secured funding through an SEF grant. So shout out to SEF also to create this um, decorative fence gate in the garden space, and the design was done by the fifth graders in STEM class. So they made prototypes. They used pipe cleaners. They did some three D printing of different portions of the design, we used an engineering design process to create it. Then it was a collaboration with PATHS, the Portland Arts and Technology High School, and those students welded the fence, and it's a collaborative project with our art teachers because the fence is going to serve as a permanent display for interchangeable art, like 3D sculptures, and we brought in um, an artist in residence who's going to work with our students to create these um, amazing sculptures that move with the wind and they can be changed out seasonally. So talk about integrating all of the disciplines and that is um, and, and that is a direct result of investment in, in these positions. So 
Um, our, our theme this year has been, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that was, that's an African proverb. And a lot of our work has had to go fast over two years. Like, let's kick it in, get settled, get it done. And we are definitely in that refinement phase right now of um, reflecting on all the great things that have happened and um, slowing it down a bit and thinking about, okay, what are, what are our strategic next steps? Um, so with these incremental investments that have taken place and with what um, we hope to have over the next couple of years, um, I know that we will continue to with that really good work and going far together. Awesome. Any questions for Kelly? Go ahead, one word. Jackie? Could you go to plant some flowers? Well, I hope the Kalanians will come and help us plant sunflowers. Yes, that is um, part of our plan. So when the incoming third graders come for their step-up day, one of the stops on the tour is um, planting a sunflower seed in the garden, and then when they come back in the fall, it's all growing up and waiting for them. It's just a really sweet and symbolic moment for them. It was incredible. Yeah. The children were incredible. May I tell just once, this little girl, took her sunflower plant and put it in the in the hole. She did this and then she looked around and she found a stick and a little pebble. And the teacher said to her, well, what are you doing? She said, well, I want to know where mine is when I come to school in the fall. I mean, if just those types of experiences, just that day with those second graders was absolutely incredible. Just one of the best days I've ever had, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about what, Mark? All right. <laughs> Can you pass the clicker, oh, Cal, sure. to Bart?
between six weeks to a quarter. If there are any longer than that and we cannot make any gains, we do end up moving into special referrals. We have five in the referral process now. But this uh, bridge teacher works with the teachers in the regular ed classrooms, <coughs> and they uh, work together to develop interventions and work together to, um, to write the referrals. Uh, it's been going very well. They have switched their focus to co the coaching model so that in the past, teachers would work harder than the kids sometimes. And we're trying to reverse that practice and really make, uh, give the kids some ownership. Um, other highlights and successes at the middle school, but David came back with the situation he had to deal with at the middle school today, but um, a highlight would be David's work with restorative practices um, with the teachers and students, the athletic eligibility using habits of work and learning, a schedule, which I am still so thankful for, which allows time for teachers to work together. Our teachers do not work alone ever at the middle school. And our RISE program, so you can kind of see there's a nice um, art, vertical articulation between Wetworth and the middle school. We both have a RISE program, and next year we're working on a, 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 an advisory type program, so it'll be again a nice transition to the high school following year. Um, I did want to bring up the Building Safety Ed Tech, which I will again be discussing. I think I've talked about this person every year. It's only an ed tech position, but it is desperately needed for those kiddos who are back and forth all day long in the school. It is still a concern for me. So this is complicated. This but is exciting. A, pardon? But exciting. But yes. exciting. <laughs> so I, I hope I can explain this well. I'm sure we already talked about some of it. Um, so I have some retirements, and I have some changes in the student population, which is going to allow for this realignment. It has been, as long as I have been here, we have only had two librarians for 100,000 students, which is shocking. The middle school has never had a full-time librarian. We have been lucky to have a librarian one day a week. Um, it's not enough, although the, the, the librarian that we share with the high school is fabulous and she has made great strides. I cannot imagine what could happen if I had a full time um, <coughs> librarian and legal specialist at the middle school. Um, we really need to fully develop the learning commons. Uh, we're slowly working our way there. We have an acre space in our little space, but we have no one to man that space or to use it with students. Um, so I am looking for this this um, this person in place of a retirement would be the tech teacher. In order to keep my unique schedule in place so that teachers can continue to work together, I need a place for these kiddos to go. And I need to continue teaching them those tech skills. And we're seeing that what we're teaching our students after you've heard from Kelly is very different than what we have been teaching them in the past. We're going to move to a computer science curriculum. And my, I have a 0.5 tech IC. She's also a 0.5 teacher. So she is going to pick up computer science. The library media specialist will also pick up some computer science pieces, as well as teaching our sixth graders library curriculum, which they have not had in years at the middle school. So it could be very exciting. Additionally, it supports the high school. The ASK really informs us that they need a full-time librarian. Is that right, David? Yes. Yes, because you've been telling me that about that for a long time. And um, I've saved up 0.2 FTE to support that work at the high school. Um, I'm, I have 11 classrooms the sixth grade. Um, they, my my um, population is 21 to 1 student to teacher ratio. I have 12 classrooms in the seventh grade. If I lose one classroom teacher, I will remain at 21 to 1. If I keep the 12 in eighth grade, it will still stay, stay 21 to 1. It's a larger class. So I am able to lose one classroom teacher. I can reallocate that teacher to have another IC type position. 
So right now, I have humanities, or I have a, an ELA instructional coach, and I have a math instructional coach. I've always wanted those to be humanities instructional coach and sciences instructional coach. So they would work with all of the just the staff in my building, which is not what happens now. I, have, I do share one who works also at the high school. And I also needed a group of strategists to guide all of the work that we're doing at the middle school. The work that teachers are doing is very complex. Mm -hmm. It's so, even from five years ago, it's very different. Teachers are working really hard. Um, they, need, they need help and support as we move into efficiency-based education. They need help developing scales, working on the curriculum. Um, doing common assessments together, um, developing those um, the strategies that will work for all the students in the classrooms. And that is not easy work. They need help and support doing that. So I am look, looking for that improvement strategies to drive, guide the transition to proficiency-based um, education, provide services to teachers, um, and also to work cross space so that person would also make sure that there's vertical articulation with the high school improvement strategist, work with Wentworth and uh, K2 improvement strategist to work on that vertical articulation. Um, and that will also help my ICs continue their work with their teachers, but my ICs also work with the um, uh, math support and um, reading support classrooms. I only have one teacher in each. So they also support that work they, uh, with students, and they help with data. And they make sure that everybody has the data that, everybody, that teachers need to make decisions about kids and about their instruction. Other questions? Did I miss anything, Julia? Um, I think that just one of the things that we looked at, you know, back in our pre-budget kind of prep work that we did as a K-12 Leadership Council was enrollment. And so um, it's, it's one of those decisions that we had to make. Do we increase class sizes in order to better support the work that's happening? Um, and so what I really, you know, Barr was really asked to go back to our building and reanalyze everything and come back with a proposal. And so what you see in this mission critical um, budget here, which is... Uh, actually a point two FTE savings um, that we are that allows us to offset the needs at the high school this year uh, took a lot of work and a lot of strategic thinking. It meant that she had to rethink her schedules. It meant that she had to rethink the way um, students are assigned to different classes. And you know that's a challenge, but um, I'm so proud of her willingness and open-mindedness to think really critically about what are the real needs and how can we how can we meet those needs within our existing resources. So I think that it's super exciting, and I could talk for hours about what this is going to mean for the middle school, um, but I won't do that. But I do just want to bring your attention again to you know the blue sheet so that you're seeing exactly how this works out in dollars and cents. So a lot of improvements to just what we're going to be able to offer our students at the middle school without asking for um, an increase in funding there. So. And I did want to add, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort growing our teacher leaders. And this is going to be, this, all that work benefits us. And I have teachers, I mean, Joanne, um, when we work with USM, these teachers are in cohorts, we your cohorts, and I have teachers ready to step into these roles because of the work that we do with USA. And we really look at this improvement strategist position as a way for us to build an internal leadership pipeline. So um, when we do, when we do uh, post these as anticipated openings in 6, in 6, 8, and 9, 12, it will be an internal posting only because obviously we can't bring someone in from the outside and without adding to our budget. So um, we're really excited to give this opportunity to our teachers. And I know there's already a buzz about the district um, in hopes that you know this will become a, a successful part of our budget and we'll be able to make it happen. And it also goes back to um, what I was saying earlier about how the job has shifted. You know, the role of the principal, all of the things that a principal has always had to do still exist, but now they also have um, all of these other new tasks at hand. Um, think similarly about the role of a superintendent. As I start to work towards this creative funding model, I have to have a whole different mindset than, and, a, and a whole different skill set 
than a superintendent who was just working within, you know, a traditional budget would have to have. And so um, I don't have that yet, but I'm working on it. Um, and so I think for our principals, when you think about 714 kids in the school, you know, and you only have Barb and Dave leading all of that work, Dave's really taking a strong lead on the student support side of things. Barb's obviously making sure that the buses run on time and everybody has their meals and the classes have, the teachers have what they need. It's more of like the operations and management piece and also leading the instructional program. Um, but it's, it's a lot for one person to be able to do really effectively. And so we believe that this improvement strategist position allows us to take a new, innovative, fresh look at, um, at, at the needs of our staff and students. And so I see this person really helping Barb and Dave support the staff because we, um, we're really good at rolling things out in public <laughs> education. And then uh, the part that I think is challenging is going back and inspecting what we s expect, but also providing the support and differentiating our staff learning the same way we do our student learning. So that's um, a big hope and part of our vision in creating this, this position moving forward. And I'll just add that I thought this was like a really creative, new, unique idea that was just happening here in Scarborough. But I was talking with um, the superintendent slash principal in Old Orchard Beach, and they're doing something similar at their middle school and bringing in this kind of like lead of teacher and learning there. So we've been sharing job descriptions, and um, I think they might have already hired, but um, we're hoping to post that position soon as an anticipated opening, again, because the market's really competitive. Jackie? I'm trying to formulate a question that is intelligent. <laughs> the bottom line for me is that class size has always been a big deal with me, mm -hmm. as well as adequate supervision. Anybody who knows me knows I fought for principals at the middle school, assistant principal at the middle school, and building principals at the K-2 schools. So uh, that's important. Class size has always been important. So I guess I'm asking, I, I hear what you're saying about this position mm -hmm. and how important it has become in our schools. But can you weigh that against smaller class size? I don't know. I'm only throwing that out because if you're interested in education, you know that class size has been predominant in educating children for years. And the fewer children that an individual teacher has to deal with, especially today when we're talking about the numbers of children who become aggressive and special needs, uh, I just wonder if there's a way to measure that. So there's actually a lot of ways to measure that. And um, when we're talking about increasing our class sizes, it brings them up to 21 at the middle school, which is still very um, manageable and, and right. is within our range. Before we even looked at numbers, we talked about what it, what is our range of acceptable class size. Because although class size matters, it only matters if you have a highly skilled teacher. Um, and so if our teachers aren't getting the support that they need, it doesn't matter if there's 30 kids in the class or 10 kids in the class, if they're not, they need to be effective in their instructional practices. And so we believe that that professional support and being able to um, better support our teachers is more, I think, is a better, um, we'll get a better return on our investment than if there were four less kids in the class. So um, I don't know if I share that same exact view with everyone. I see lots of heads nodding. But um, another really interesting thing to look at, because I know we have lots of um, researchers in the room, is you know John Hattie's meta-analysis of what are the uh, 150 things that impact or influence student achievement. And when you look at class size, it's like 35 on the list. So again, that's looking at it in isolation. So yeah, when we have really skilled teachers first, the number one in influencer of student achievement, um, and lower class sizes, then that's a benefit. But I would... I would, um, I would make the trade, if you will, to have slightly higher class sizes, which are still very manageable and better support for our teachers. And the, it, it, the, the support piece, as you described earlier, is we're asking at every phase level teachers to change their shift their practices in line with that digital 
So we are flying the airplane. It's not, it, it, you know, it, it, things, all things were static. We would still need that position in order to support the teachers. But we really are asking teachers to um, shift some of their practices. And that just requires additional support. And having these folks at the phase levels will provide a, quite a bit of that support for them. And I would just add to what Monique's saying about the shifting of the practice. It's shifting practice in a really accelerated way. And so um, I think that's another important factor to consider. Um, we really think that as we, to, to effectively make these changes, we need to have that support. You're not increasing class size. You're moving 11 classes no, to 11 exactly. instead of 11 to 12. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fine. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm opposed to it at all. I'm seeking information because I want what is best for our students and our teachers. And I want to hear the professionals talk about the impact that it's going to have on our students and our teachers when you compare to class size and some other things. Mm -hmm. I'm satisfied. Thank you. Great. Jody? I think that's a really important point that Kelly just made that sort of highlights that we I would hate for us to be using the terms increased class size when in all actuality it's the same exact class size that they currently are used to. Yeah. It's that maintaining group class is just size. moving to the next phase level, which currently has one additional classroom, they just won't have that next year. Right. So, so they will be staying in the same size class that they currently are. That's right. a really important point. So right now, um, our sixth grade classes on average are 20.5 students. Um, and in and, and seventh grade, it's 20.8 students. And then um, in, in eighth grade, it's 20 students. And next year, what we're projecting is 20.6 in sixth grade, 20.5 in seventh grade, and 20.8 in um, eighth grade. So some classes of 20, some classes of 21. We won't be splitting any children. <laughs> <coughs> so that's a good point. Mary? I like to question about the, you mentioned restorative practices. And I just wondered, what does that entail? Restorative practices? Yes. What that means is um, having students who might have a difficulty with communicating back and forth to sit down and solve their problem together, rather than saying at a model, well, there's been harm that one person has caused the other, we're going to separate them. And it's impossible to separate them in every instance. So it's to be able to open up that line of communication and teach them, if you have a problem, these are your resources, and let's sit down and solve the problem. And then you work with circles and teachers. That's right. And then uh, our biggest concern with that is for someone to sit down and have that conversation with a student. That they need the, the skills, the tools to be able to create that that relationship with the student, so that the student would feel comfortable maybe coming to them to report something, or to sit down to help solve a problem. So the relationships between our our staff and our students are very important. And so each. Uh, each week we have specific time allotted that is, is uh, during our homeroom schedule time, on our present schedule, that we designate as that's the time to sit down and have that conversation with your students. And it, it uh, might not be something that's really deep, it might be something just to find someone in common. And then as we go around the circle and we share something in common, I might look at someone that I might never know shared that. So it creates the relationship staff to student, but also student to student as well. And then if you, because it sounds like you're going to have an advisory period as well, or some kind of advisory, so like, yes. would that person kind of take on that role Correct. as well as kind of being that person that can help kids with that? Yes. And it's really about um, moving away from a punishment kind of mindset and more about a growth mindset. It allows us to keep our students in school rather than sending them out, um, you know, on suspensions or even putting them in in-school suspension and working through issues because we know if they're not in school, they can't learn. Um, so it, it really is, it works well when done well, but it does require a lot of staff training and development. And with those suspensions, there's nothing to store them. The student right. may go away. If there's a person in the school, they may come back even more angry with mm -hmm. that student that, that they had had the conflict with, and this gets past that conflict. The and their lifetime skills, which are very important. A beautiful way in which it is summarized for me is um, in the system of discipline where we um, only provide punishments and consequences, we teach students what not to do, but we don't, we miss the opportunity to teach students what to do. Mm -hmm. And so restorative practices takes it to the next level. 
on, on how to problem solve when you are having an issue with someone or when an incident occurs. Um, we work with the students to let them know that that's not appropriate, but also provide them with the skills and the tools so that they can um, learn what the right thing is to do and how to do it. So I think Kelly had a question and then Jackie. I heard your timer. So you have, that was the that was the presentation. Two okay, good. Two minutes and nine seconds. So you're shifting <laughs> and not <laughs> and not um, expanding the number of classrooms. Does that help your space crunch at all? Because I know you have teachers in closets and on carts. Mm -hmm. It would give you one room to use for a teacher on the cart. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Congratulations. Good work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Jackie. My question is. The technique you're describing, do we use it with youngsters who isolate themselves? In other words, the youngster who stands by themselves at recess or mm -hmm. wants to sit by themselves at, at lunch or uh, comes into a classroom and after everybody's seated, they take the seat furthest away from everybody else. Well, so we're um, actually, we have one of our PLTs is developing um, a, a mentoring model to help address students who are experiencing some of that isolation. I don't know if, Kelly, you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, it, it's, it's partly that, but I think there are um, a number of reasons we would identify a student who needs kind of a pot, an, an additional positive adult connection in their life, and it is um, really closely connected to what Dave described. Um, but tapping into community resources to create those relationships. I think to your um, question, that's a PLT. That was a teacher-generated idea. It's a group of actually a lot of ed techs who um, do, for example, lunch duty or recess duty and have that unique perspective of 225 students every single day. Um, and so those students are identified and on, on the radar. Creating opportunities for them to connect with a caring adult. Um, I think, additionally to your point, the restorative practices at K-5, um, because the emphasis is on teaching expected behavior, it's a natural, it's a natural fit. It's very much in line with the work that we um, are already doing, um, and there are components of it that we can um, learn from to to um, continue that face-to-face -phase collaboration and connection. And I think at K2 especially, we, we have done some restorative justice work as well um, with community circles. And so talking to kids about you know, when, when this happens in the classroom, this is how people feel. And do you want people to feel that way? Do you want them to, you know, or how do you want to feel in the classroom? So it's, it's really, um, you know, not only teaching them what we want them to do, but, but why, you know, the, the, the personal connections between kids about what that what your behavior does to other people in the classroom. Um, so you know that it has been happening at K two as well. And that's a, a lot of the, the social emotional work that all of our schools are doing to really talk about empathy and compassion and as part of the teaching mental child. Donna, I just want to compliment the staff for looking for efficiencies and ways to swap out retirement positions for other needed positions. But I've also watched us for the past several years, some of our K-8 schools have asked for nothing, and nothing again the next year, and nothing again the year after, and at some point, there's going to need to be you know, some opportunities for you to ask for things. I know we're really trying to put all our efforts into the, you know, the high school level, and that's admirable on your part for, you know, <clears throat> for being willing to give up so that the high school can you know, possibly get what they really need to have to have at this time. But well, I think that's where our, our K-12 work comes in, in that, phase, that second phase of looking at the student-centered budget and we're prioritizing things, you know, as a district. Because I, too, like you, believe that it shouldn't be a cycle, like it's the middle school's turn and then it's the high school's turn and then it's, it needs to be needs-based. And so that's really what our focus is. But also knowing that you can, a lot of times we can make improvements um, with our existing resources if we just... Uh, realign or if we, you know, analyze what, what it is we need in order to make that growth or that change happen. So um, I, I feel that that was really balanced this year in our conversation. I don't know if you guys feel the same. Okay.
Okay. Um, David, do you have the clicker? I do. All right. You take it away. It's time for the high school. There is coffee if anyone wants to um, have coffee. Are you ready for a five-minute break now? David, do you mind if we bump up the five minutes? So, good afternoon. Um, I envision how everybody's hopped up on caffeine. I'm going to do about 20 questions compared to two or three of the other things. The leadership team, including Mr. Legage over there, are ready for those. So, um, I look forward to those. So, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you today regarding um, the impact of the investments that you supported as a board last year and some of what we're looking for mission critical investments for this year. Um, if you take a look at the, the slide that we have on the overhead screen for you, I think one thing I want to define for you, and you hear me say this throughout our presentation, is we've got a learner-centered focus in the first slide, and the reason for that is oftentimes we've been talking about a student-centered focus, student-centered learning focus, but we've been trying to balance that with the resources and needs supports in place for staff to be able to implement what needs to be in place for students. So, um, Mr. Alpenstein has coined the phrase a learner-centered focus, which I think is idealistic for what we want to do here um, this phase of the And that first portion of that slide will capture some of the investments from this year that really have had a great impact on Scarborough High School. The laptop program is in its second year of implementation. We spent an enormous amount of time, again, this year working on teachers successfully implementing in their curriculum and in the classroom with the help of Jen Adams, our structural coaches, um, Monique and Catherine as director of teaching and learning. I feel like we're growing leaps and bounds in year two. Um, the student of learning focus is part of that learning center focus with our advisory program and our academic enrichment and support time. I know I've spoken to you about this in the past, but you know, our advisory program and A East really provides some resources embedded within the school day that we think are hugely important for students' academic and personal development. And I'll highlight those a little bit in the next slide. Um, the director of teaching and learning, that, that, that position is going to be, um, that name is going to be changed. You heard Kelly and Julie referencing that earlier. But really, Catherine Ruby has been hugely instrumental in guiding our staff, navigating them through these shifts in our practices. Uh, we have a lot of work um, that needs to be planned. We need staff need to be supported on how to best grow um, in their practices, instructional practices, curriculum uh, assessments. So she has done a great job of supporting our staff and working with our teacher leaders. And then the staff development time, I, I know that um, we were very fortunate to be supported to provide we provided the staff development time this year through our late starts and some of our additional time for NEAS, but we have our performance evaluation and professional growth um, time that we've had to use. We've had PLT, NEAS self-study, specific content area, uh, curriculum development. Uh, we're shifting to a proficiency-based education, and we have proficiency-based diploma requirements that are for current 8th graders, next year's ninth graders, so staff development was critical to be able to provide supports to shift and grow our staff in those areas. The new schedule is in phase one. The academic enrichment and support time is tied directly to providing students within the school day the opportunity to meet with staff, whether it's enrichment or support for um, all kinds of reasons that students typically have struggled to find time to meet with staff. We have students who are very busy. They have challenging schedules. Oftentimes they can't meet before or after school. And sometimes their study halls don't align with our teachers' prep time. So 35 minutes between the first and second period of each day gives them a chance to get that extra help to finish up that quiz, uh, perhaps to engage in some enrich enrichment activities and just connect with their teachers. One day out of the week is our advisory program. And our advisory program is really, we've got two strategically important pieces to this advisory program that our school has desperately needed. One is to have another caring adult 
in the lives of our students. They can guide and support them and encourage them throughout their high school career. Uh, the second piece is to have activities put in place that provide the academic, social, emotional, and health and wellness needs of our students. And we're starting to see some of the benefits from that all <coughs> Phase one of our new schedule was this year, and we wanted to put these two components in place and grow these, learn from uh, what we have in place, and, and make whatever adjustments were necessary. Other important investments um, that have had great dividends are our new staff. As you know, we didn't have enough staff to support some of our existing programs. Oftentimes, we were turning students away from the courses that they wanted to sign up for because we didn't have enough of the teaching resources. Our new staff last year that were hired for this year allowed us, one, to better support the existing needs that we had for academic programs and courses, uh, put support in place for some of our new programs, our AP Computer Programming, Robotics, um, a, a, a number of courses that we've had on the planning stages but have never been able to implement them. Implementation of the proficiency based education. We have a workshop where you've heard all the different components for proficiency based education. Bottom line to that is it's a shift in some of our practices instructional practices, curriculum, how we assess students. So, important for us is to have the time to be able to do that. And then there's another factor here that uh, for those of you who have taught before, know that when you've had a system that's been in place since 1992 for a schedule, and you've been used to a certain amount of time, a certain amount of days, and now we're shifting to 75 minutes every other day, that's going to change how you deliver your curriculum, how you have those digestible chunks of content. At the same time, we're aligning the proficiency best educa education and standards. Thank you. And we now have new assessment practices. All of that is going to require time. Time for staff to be able to grow and make the most of the new schedule. So professional learning time for us at the high school will also be essential next year. An improvement strategist, which was our director of teaching and learning this year, which is uh, the role that we've heard referenced. With, with the work that we have already been accomplished, have already accomplished excuse me, this year, and with the growth as a district in our proficiency-based education, um, it's going to be, I think, highly critical that the high school have this person in place. We need staff and, and teacher leaders to be able to have somebody to guide them through this work, to work with our instructional coaches, with Monique um, and the other phase level instructional coaches to make sure that as we implement things, teachers have the resources, the supports, on how to successfully make those shifts. And so the improvement strategies is one of our priorities for next year in, in, in addition to the professional learning. <coughs> um, the internship and academy coordinator is very exciting for us. Um, if you attended this morning's uh, school and business partnership, for as long as I've been attending that for the last two or three years, we have had, just like with the graduation requirements, this um, need for somebody to coordinate uh, at our phase level with all the resources our community provides. And that coordination is not just uh, connecting the resources to our teachers here, but it's creating a program that will be a part of our graduation requirements. Our graduation requirements now are going to require students to have a personal learning experience um, that they're keeping their digital portfolio for, for the four years of their at Scarborough High School. Those personal learning experiences can be uh, service learning projects, internships, apprenticeships, taking a college class, volunteering, you know, those kinds of rich uh, personal experiences that don't just happen in the confines of Scarborough High School, but happen outside. And so we have a wealth of resources in this community that want to partner with us, and this intern position will be somebody who will coordinate that work. Also, I think what's very interesting is a part of the internship program would be a curriculum tied to some of those really important uh, qualities that the local community businesses are telling us that students need to have in place. Part of like the career education, uh, resume writing, uh, how you interview, uh, those qualities that, that businesses are looking for employees, problem solvers, uh, their, their 
team people that are able to work well and communicate well with others. So that curriculum will be a part of the work that's done with this internship and academy coordinator. And the last piece for that is NAF, which is the National Academic, excuse me, National Academy Foundation, provide, provides a model for us to grow career academies. So whether it's in technology or any of the other choices they have, they'll provide for us a model on how to best create those types of programs and offerings, and we can grow it from the resources we have in this community. And then lastly, um, we have, right now we have a point eight librarian who is fantastic. Barbara referenced her earlier. She's doing a wonderful job of supporting the middle school and the high school. But we have a thousand students, and we have a point eight librarian. Uh, NEASC uh, requires for schools with 400 or more students to have a full-time librarian. But even if it wasn't a NEASC requirement, we need a live full-time librarian librarian of the high school to grow our learning columns and to provide the resources for staff and students that we need. In addition, for our 1,000 students right now, we have a, par a part-time student assistance counselor. So many times I've worked with our student assistance counselor who doesn't just work with uh, substance abuse uh, counseling, but also works on the other social emotional needs of our students and oftentimes is supporting our social workers. Has, she has wonderful ideas for some programs, but just doesn't have the time to, to, to support individual student needs and put some of these programs and offerings in place that will help students with their social and emotional issues. So we're asking to go from 0.5 for this position to full time. So um, in essence, I think at the high school, we are really a school in transition. Um, we're shifting some practices. I have to finish by saying this. We have a, a great staff who are dedicated to our students. We have fantastic students who are high achievers, and we have a very supportive community that have high expectations. With this growth and the shift in our practices, we need support. And we need to make sure that as we're shifting our practices, that we're doing it very well. Um, and so a lot of what we've been asking for for this particular phase, for this particular phase of the budget has been rethinking our budget needs as compared to what we had in plan prior to this year and focusing on those things I just described. Thank you, David. <coughs> Any questions? Kelly? Um, <coughs> I just have one question and it's not even necessarily for me, but you may know we've spent several lifetimes looking at schedules lately, um, school start times in particular, and um, and looking at other high schools and how they set up their day. Um, more than a handful, two to three that I saw, um, have their AEs period first thing in the morning rather than between classes. So can you just explain a little bit why ours is between one and two? Sure. Uh, part of um we looked at the schedule and, and we talked about the, the best place to put that time. We were actually thinking along the lines of um, just like the, the recent initiative to look at school start time. So when our students come into school, if you look at their typical day, um, to have a, a class period and then go to your A East, you're getting a, uh, a change between period one and two. We have a chance to shift gears a little bit, maybe downshift. Um, work on some of those things that you need to do, um, whether it's getting academic enrichment support or you're just working on some of your homework or meeting with your advisory. Then you go to your period three class, you have another class, and then the, excuse me, the period two class. And then the next period, period three next year, is lunch. So you have a class, you have AEs to your advisory, you have a class, and then period three will be the lunch period, even though you're still going to have a class, and then you finish the day with a class. So some of the schools that I've <coughs> talked to and that we researched said that it was a ch it sometimes posed a challenge when you started or ended your day in advisor or AE East. A lot of it, I think, is tied to where students are at that particular part of the day, you know, it's emotionally and physically and mentally. So we were trying to capture in our new schedule a way to provide um, a less stressful schedule and also timely breaks in that day that benefited them emotionally and physically and mentally. So that's why we went between periods one and two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mary and then Jackie. Um, I just had a question because I know 
last year in the budget there was talk of you know adding some teachers to fulfill the needs for the um, you know for the eight period um, day and so I just wondered so how are you managing without those you know extra teachers that before you were thinking you know were, were a possibility? That's a great question. We uh, so obviously when we were looking at the needs we had five FTEs in the last year's budget, which allowed us some of that capacity. We looked at the existing, um, when we were looking at our resources that we currently had, we looked at the existing class sizes and where we needed to grow. And we believe that right now with the room that we have and our new offerings and with our electives and the current class sizes, uh, that next year when we go to an eight block schedule, we have the capacity, but we'll have more accurate information and data in the next year as to exactly where those students landed. Because our survey of the students last year told us that almost 70% of them said that they were going to choose an additional class and would be an elective, and not another core class or study hall. But the reality behind what they're going to select, what they said in the survey, won't be realized until we finish with our signups in the next couple of weeks. So we believe we have the capacity right now for those students to take those courses they've said that they're going to take and sign up for without creating um, the same scenario we were in last year when we got the first students away from certain classes. And next year's data, if it demonstrates to us that we're busting out of the seams in those areas that we predicted we might, then it would give us the rationale to come back to the table and say, we need this teaching position in this particular content area because this is where the students are signing up. And that's not where our need is. And I think one of the things that David and the leadership team at the high school did was, again, you make a plan two years ago, but is that plan still the best plan now? Um, and so it was kind of a reassessment of, okay, it'd be great to offer more options to students, but is that really the most critical need? And so through, our, through the budget process and the hard work that the leadership team has done at the high school, they were able to reassess that. And so I think we always are going to be, you know, planning for short-term goals, but also long-term goals. But our job as school leaders is to constantly be a reassessing that. And so, um, again, like the middle school, I'm super excited about the work that the high school has done because it really has, they really pushed themselves to think critically about what is the, what is the, the immediate need and the biggest thing for us <coughs> when it comes to our investments this year. No, I agree. I think the, the you know, positions that you've chosen to add, I think, are just so needed. Uh, over the years, we've heard off and on that youngsters are unable to do band because uh, of their schedule. Is that, is that still the case? Some students who wish to have band have, have difficulty with the schedule? Um, I think in general terms, we have students at times because of the demands of the schedule that we've had with only seven periods graduation requirements and some students wanted to take additional science and additional math because of the nature of what they want to do outside of once they've graduated. Um, they've, they've at times chosen not to take an art or a band because the, the schedule didn't have the flexibility or capacity. So that is, you know, it's anecdotal, but that is true what's been said. This schedule now allows more flexibility and a larger capacity because students can take an additional class. Um, and also the new graduation requirements that we've created allows much more flexibility in terms of students being able to satisfy their graduation requirements but also take those elective courses that they're passionate about or they just want to try. When I taught at the high school, we had three lunch periods. And the first two lunch periods was banned. And the band all went to the third lunch. I don't know how they worked that out, but that was, you know, I taught at the high school for 12, 13 years, and I never heard anybody say that they had a conflict, so I didn't know if, how we worked that out at Sparrow High School. Actually, the new schedule is going to allow us for moving course from outside the school day into the school day. So the students can take it at their class during the actual schedule. So there's been some shifts and some things that have been moved in the past outside the schedule because we didn't have the room for some students to take those things. So there's been a lot of advantages. So between the new graduation requirements and the new schedule, we really have 
I think provided um, more opportunity, more flexibility, more capacity for our students. Well, and for Jackie too, one of the things that we're talking about as we're you know planning for the future is what does a school day look like for each individual student? I mean, even um, as we talk about adjusting our start times, if we go to an 8.50 start, students who want to access Cats or Westbrook um, Vocational Technical School will have to be on a, a slightly different schedule. So their day might start earlier and end earlier. Um, or they may have, because their day starts and ends earlier, um, they may have an opportunity to take an additional course if that's something that they choose to do. But we're going to have to, once we have that start time decision, really dig down and say, like, okay, so what does this really mean for all students? And um, I just think, uh, to the point that the young man made last night at the town council meeting, the way we think about this thing called school is really evolving and shifting. And it might not be that all students have four years of high school. They might be able to um, accelerate their earning of the essential credits or um, demonstrating proficiency in three years or three and a half years instead of four. And so we're talking about different dual enrollment options um, that students can have. So maybe they're leaving Scarborough High School as a sophomore in college because they've obtained um, that many credits while they're enrolled. So there's a lot of, a lot of things in motion. Um, but the, the one thing I do know is that we are not going to be able to provide our students all the experiences that they need in six hours and 25 minutes, or that they want, um, rather, I should say, in six hours and 25 minutes. So that's also part of our thinking, is being like really flexible around what does a school day look like for each individual student. And the graduation requirements that the high school is working on um, is a huge step towards that and are really exciting. And I imagine, you know, the future of school being that every student has an individualized education plan, not just special education students, that we're really customizing education um, to each individual student. Well, I've always felt that a student who wanted to be in the band and, and had to choose something else mm -hmm. to meet the requirements, being shortchanged because there's been an investment in music education on behalf of the family over the years and now they get to perform, so to speak, at a higher level. Right. And somehow we're preventing that. Mm -hmm. And and I think anything that we can do through their schedule to make that opportunity available so that they can continue that uh, yeah. is Great. important. Yeah, I agree. Any other questions about the high school? All right. So, who's on deck? Joanne Sizemore. Yes, I have the next four slides of different balls that I juggle. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's following along in the picture? Oh, you're done, Joanne. I'm done. <laughs> So health services, um, health services really has changed dramatically in schools. Um, you know, the primary purpose of having uh, our health services is to ensure that our kids are healthy and safe during the school day. And, um, and our nurses uh, do a lot of uh, good work with flu clinics, bringing those into the schools for both uh, staff and students working with the VNA. Um, they do all of our trainings for bus drivers, uh, first responders in the office, special ed, ed techs. Uh, they, they do all that training for us for CPR with those people, which is a huge saving to our district in, in having them provide those kind of trainings. And so for the last four years, we've been um, working and thinking and looking in and researching um, a management system because up until this year everything was done handwritten in a book and you know all when someone moved getting their health record all together handwritten and there's so many there's different programs out there and one of our school nurses Melissa Martinez who had worked in Texas came up here and said you enter it by hand <laughs> and was just shocked and so kind of encouraged us to kind of get on board and start thinking so we spent a year of uh, planning and reviewing and looking at different programs and we decided on health office anywhere 
And Melissa and Patty Boldick have been our lead <coughs> trainers um, with the program, and uh, now everything is getting online. And um, they've entered some of the records. When a kid comes to the clinic, they go into the system. They chart it that way. Kids' records are in there. Immunizations are in there. When a kid moves, they click a button, and the health record comes out with all of that information. There's still more work to be done because... Um, uh, besides the immunizations, um, they are also looking at different needs that kids have and how they track that and how they chart it. Um, the program is able to um, send an email to the parent when the medication is getting low at school as a reminder. Um, so there's a lot of benefits and we're in the process of um, continuing our work with it. The challenges is, what is a school nurse today? Mm -hmm. And instead of putting it all out there, I went, and I was, when I was preparing the slide, I went, page 48. All you have to do is read page 48, and that's what a school nurse does today with diabetes. <coughs> Severe medical um, um, conditions that are in our school. Um, concussions has been a huge, huge problem. Uh, problem for our students and even some of our staff and how they manage that. Um, medication for students is, you know, I would say most of the buildings might have over 100 kids who might be on medication and they are dispensing that medication at the schools. So instead of writing it all down, please read what the school nurse does today because there's so many perceptions out there probably with the public that say, oh, the kid comes to the he comes to the clinic, has a headache, they give them some Tylenol, or, you know, they take their fever, or, but it really is very complicated today in what school nurses are doing in our schools. And I would just say that's not an exhaustive list. Of course, imaginary boo-boos are not on there, and um, also we have some nurses who ride the bus with students who need that level of care, so they're riding to and from, um, you know, home to school with the students as well. Okay. Yeah. Do you know how many students in our system are not immunized? I would have that information. Uh, they, the nurses do have that information. We keep track of all of that. Because if a parent doesn't want to immunize their child, they have to sign a release saying that they're not right. going to do that. I think it's a, something that the board may wish, not who, but how many. Okay. <coughs> can you jot that on your index card, Jack, so then we can get that data for you? Thanks. Other questions before I move on? I just yeah. have one question. Um, is there a, a required ratio like occupational therapist for school nurses and <coughs> are we close to it? Because it seems like we have a very small number of nurses and LPNs and medical assistants for our student body. I'm sure I don't know it off the top of my head, but when we have we have two nurses at the high school. We have um, 1.8 nurses, 1.6 nurses at, excuse me, 1.8 nurses at the middle school. At uh, Wentworth, we have one nurse, one LPN, and we have a medical assistant who helps out and goes between the schools. And we have one nurse for Blue Point and Eight Corners. Um, the nurse at Wentworth goes to Pleasant Hill. Yeah, it just makes me nervous not to have one in each building. It just, it, they, they travel a lot, and um, I was going to get them a four-wheeler to go off the Eastern Trail and get the Blue Point. It would be a lot easier. <laughs> a gear. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's not in the budget. <laughs> no. no. I get cheaper than a staff number, though. It's in the budget. It's just not in the school budget. <laughs> well, yes, but we could build a bridge from Black Point Road down to the co-op at Pine Point. That saved miles. Any other questions? Okay, adult ed. Um, Page 98. Yep. <coughs> Getting carried away. With uh, adult ed, we've had some changes in that um, we have a part-time director who has done a really um, a great job going out into the community and building some of these programs. Um, our CNA program, um, this morning they were talking about Genesis was with the school businesses. Um, we had partnered with them, done CNA programs there. We're now with Piper Shores, Maine Veterans Home, uh, and Genesis that's up there. 
Last year we um, graduated 48 people with CNA um, in one year. And so um, we're also working with Piper Shores right now. They're um, building a new facility and uh, are in need of medication, um, certified residential medication aids. And we have programs to certify and do those kind of trainings. Um, so and pharmacy techs and so forth. So um, the uh, director, Joan Tremblay, has been working with uh, very heavily with uh, Piper Shores right now in the main veterans home. And continuing, we have two, three classes that are going right now for CNA. So we're very pleased with how that is going and helping people to see um, some benefits in getting people employed and jobs that are needed. English language learners, we had a small program here in Scarborough. And so Joan uh, connected with Portland who had overflows. And um, we have a program here now with maybe 20, 22 people. Now uh, we offer day and evening classes in the Rock Church because we needed a space. During the day, Rock, the Rock Church has offered us a space there. And um, English language learner classes are offered there. Um, college and career uh, counseling is offered to all adults with an online career assessment and people who are thinking about going back to college or starting college, don't know what to what avenue. Um, she's done a lot of uh, promotion with that and she's been to uh, Maine Health for people who might work there who have a high school diploma and want to know how I can get into um, a college and um, college courses and what my assessment would be before I got there. Um, we do a lot with credit recovery for our students at the high school and people who are looking to get their high school diploma. It's no longer called the GED, it's called HiSET and it's an online program that uh, you have to go through <coughs> different classes before you can take the test for HiSET. And so those programs are continuing. Plus, uh, last, last year we offered over 100 enrichment classes at people in the community. Uh, such as painting is a big one, guitar playing, um, they've had um, different languages, uh, computer class for seniors, um, all of those types of programs are offered uh, through our adult ed program. <coughs> Jackie. Are any of our high school students enrolled in any <coughs> certificate program? Um, I think you need to have a high school diploma before you can begin the programs. Like a CNA, you know, um, for, the, for under adult ed. Thank you. But I know that if a student at the high school was at Westbrook region of Westbrook both, they are able to um, obtain a CNA um, certificate there. But in the adult ed program, it's uh, adults. Thank you. Yeah. How do we promote um, those classes? So um, we still we have an online, you know, we have a section on our website online. Um, we have a brochure that goes to every single home. We weren't going to do that, and but we heard from yeah. so many people who said, "I look for that booklet. You know, I keep it in the car. I don't throw it in the garbage. You know, um, and that's where we're getting most of our signups." She promotes it with, um, you know, when she's going to Piper Shores, she'll leave some there. We'll go Shores, the banks. Um, that's how and we're out there. There's also an online uh, portal through the Maine Adult Ed Association, <coughs> so that if I live in uh, South Portland, right. but I'm interested in a course, I can go on that statewide portal and find out what adult ed organization around me might have that class. So that's what I was going to ask. Are we competing with other local? Yes. High schools competitively, it seems like. Because well, um, Bitterford, Saco, and Old Orchard have a very extensive program. Um, they offer a lot of classes during the day. They would offer like um, uh, a math class, a length, an English class for people to get um, maybe um, extra help before they took the acuplacer test that you need to get into a community college. We offer those maybe at night, but some of them are online. And I don't know if it's because of where I live, but I get their yes. brochure at my home. Yeah. Old Orchard has been upping and, you know, and so instead
instead of fighting them, they're all decided to share because uh, the state might be looking at regionalizing adult ed programs, mm -hmm. and so that might be a direction that might be coming in a couple of years. And so if that happens in a couple of years, do we have the facility to sort of take that on? Mm -hmm. We don't have the space. Not during the day. Well, we're going to have empty space yeah. because their enrollment is very low. Right. We, we, that's why the English language learner program, we had, um, we used the classroom at Wentworth for a while, um, and then they needed the space back, and, um, you know, having the adults come here and so forth, so she found the Rock Church. For a while, we didn't have a place to offer CNA as she was building the program. At one point, we had a hospital bed at Blue Point in one of the extra classrooms. You know, it worked out well, but it still wasn't the facility of being in a main veterans home or Pike and Shores to do that kind of program. Right. I think one of the things that John is really cognizant of is trying to fill the niche where where the need is. Like with the, the, um, the medical workforce training programs, that's such a huge growth industry right now. And, you know, so Joan is sort of zeroing in and saying, well, where can we fill a need that, you know, another class in elementary guitar doesn't really matter because you can take that anywhere. 